Hello everyone, welcome to At The Table. I'm Audrey Galich. Thank you so much for being with us. Many times on the At The Table, we've considered the topic of human trafficking, child sex trafficking, and many times looked at its uh, what it looks like domestically and here in Metro Atlanta. We have the opportunity in this program today to talk to some people who are involved in saving children, saving young ladies from sex trafficking on the island nation of Haiti. And with me to talk about that is Ms. Mia Francine Payan. Thank you so much for being with us. You're the CEO and founder of My Sister's Place. Yes, I am. Thank you so much for being with us. And we're also joined by Dr. Michelo Pierre Jr., yeah. named for your father, who is an OBGYN, OBGYN, who works at My Sister's Place. Thank you so very much for being with us. And I'd like to tell our, our uh, viewers that uh, Dr. Pierre will be speaking in French. And thank you very much, Mia, for translating for us. We certainly appreciate that. And it's You're lovely welcome. to be able to also hear the French language. Thank you so much. Uh, Mia, how did you get started? How did you decide to found My Sister's Place? Because you had been here in Atlanta for many years. Yes, I lived in Atlanta since 1994. And um, 2010, I, after the earthquake in Haiti, I went down there and um, we, were, we were feeding some young women at a camp. And it was only young women between 12 and all the way to 18 years old. And there was a car that came by picking up young kids, but only young women from nine years old to 16 or 18. If you pass 18, you're not, you, you cannot be in the car. And I was asking questions. I was asking questions every day. I ask some questions whenever I go there. And they said, no, these girls, they're being prostitutes or they're going to traffic them between DR, Jamaica, Mexico, Dominican Republic, Dominican, yeah, Republic, yeah, Dominican mm -hmm. Republic, the next island over. Jamaica, and in the Caribbean, basically in the basin of the Caribbean, there would be traffic. And there was they, no one looking out for these girls, or their parents were willingly? Or some of their parents died in the earthquake, or some were living with family members, or some were just on their own, and they didn't have a place to go to. And, and with, the, with the third world countries, there's not enough for everybody. The wealth is not properly distributed. So these young women, they were left to themselves to their own demise. And they, they, most of these young women, they're ma marginalized. And, and I started working with them. And by working with them, meaning that, talking to them about, about self-esteem, counseling sessions sometimes, we would go there. And we started talking. And um, they said, you know, we wouldn't do that if we had a place to stay. Because we want to be doctors. We want to be nurses. We have aspiration. And, um, and I said, if we can provide that for you, would you come with me? And they said, ah, oh, no, you're not coming back. You know, people would come here in the island, and they take our pictures, and they go back. They make money off of us, and they don't come back, really. They don't do no programs. And I said to her, but I will come back. She said, no. let, let me back up just a second. What, you had some training when you were here in Atlanta. You yes. were working with Fulton County ch yes. as a child advocate for many yes. years. Yes, I was working for Fulton County. There's a background in this, yes, in this there population. Yes, I, I was working with Fulton County um, as a child advocate. I would go into homes, pick up children that have been abused sexually, um, domestic violence, children who are facing who are in the home where there's a lot of abuse between husband and wife, boyfriends and girlfriends. And also, I've worked in Miami while I went to law school. I used to clerk for a judge um, giving, um, 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 what you might call it, uh, restraining orders. Mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. serve the restraining orders and then go to the court with the victim. I would accompany the, the victim to the court to face the respondent. Sometimes it's the husband, sometimes it's a boyfriend. So there is, yeah, there's a background. And while I worked here, and I saw so much abuse, and I asked, you know, I talked to some friend, I said, you know, um, as a child, as a child, I was abused physically by my stepmom. And I felt invisible. 
and I wonder how these children, how do they feel? Have anybody talked to them? Because sometimes when you remove them in the home and you don't talk to that child, you do counseling, what kind of counseling? Are you asking the child, are you okay mentally, emotionally? Because this takes a toll on you. This in life, you may not be able to have a proper relationship with a man. You may not have a proper relationship because when these things stays and locked inside, you feel either it's something that you've done, you are invisible, the world doesn't see you. So I said to myself, I'm gonna talk about myself. And once I talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, once I talked about myself, I'll be able to communicate better with the victims. And this is how I started, by working with domestic violence shelter. Here in the States. Yes, mm -hmm. here in the States. Um, I was in the task force of domestic violence in Tallahassee before I moved to Georgia while I went to law school. And I used to work with um, Haitian Community Center. And there was a radio show. We would go on the radio show. It's called Anukoze. Let's talk. Every Friday night, which is the moon, big moon, that's when there's a lot of games on TV. And the next ripple effect is domestic violence. Is domestic violence. So we would be on the radio with the women and telling them there's seven steps. Sometimes he would beat you up and then he says, I'm sorry, it brings flowers. But you need to know your, how your self-esteem, how about how it's going to affect your children. Because domestic violence, he has a, it's a vicious cycle. It goes back from generation to generation. Emotional abuse, you are not able to have proper relationship with men, with women, with, with society. You feel that there's something wrong with you and you're not good enough. And what's interesting as you speak to me is that you've been able to witness this on, across many cultures, yes, both I in the have. United States and now Haiti. Yes, I have. That and it really doesn't discriminate. No, no, because I've worked with the gays community in Miami Beach. I've worked here with parents. I, work with, I, I worked in the state of Georgia with the judges by explaining to them, this is what we need to set in place for these women. There is services here. The worst thing in Haiti, 52% of the women in Haiti, they're marginalized. Society, the society in Haiti, it's a male dominant. And the women are basically the backbone in Haiti. Yeah, financially, socially, they're the one in the homes. And it's a hidden endemics. People don't talk about domestic violence in Haiti. People don't talk about sexual abuse in Haiti. You, if you talk, actually when I talk to matter people. matter of shame. Yes, it is, it's taboo. If you talk about it, that's mean you are taking your laundry outside. Mm. And the laundry needs to stay in the house. And, and what I tell them, I tell them, I said, when you, when you bring domestic violence in the home, your child suffers. And then she goes or he goes to to be a, a batterer or be a victim. So you need to stand up because the next place you're gonna be is the grave and your child's gonna be missing a lot. And, and when we talk to them, they're like, yeah, but we need to be empowered. So I said, I'll provide programs where you are empowered. I'll work, I work it off, I work with different um, private sectors in the community. I'll make sure that you are okay but you have to promise me that when we do this, you're gonna sign a contract, you're gonna be rescued, education, leadership skills, and economic empowerment, which is because there's no justice economy in Haiti. People are afraid that, okay, if I go and get an education, what is the next step? People are, af are afraid. So- No um, guarantees anywhere. It, there's no guarantees. But at the same time, if you have an education, you are not limited. If I, if I didn't have an education, I would not be able to counsel these women. If, I, if my world didn't expose me to certain things, I would probably be, what's my next step? And I understand that you've received um, some support, so to speak, from uh, Andrew Young. Yes. You first went to Haiti, perhaps? Yes. Was... We went down there um, in 2006, June to July 2006 in Haiti, after the, um, there was a hurricane called Jean that destroyed, totally destroyed Gonaïve in the Artibonite mm -hmm. section. And um, he sent some food down there. He sent 
um, shelled a lot of things from Walmart. A lot of um, community, we got together, the Haitian community, um, V103, um, Mr. Joseph Beasley with um, Rainbow Coalition, um, concerned black clergy. A lot of people come together because they believe that what I was doing was the right thing. And we set up two or three containers. We sent it down there. And Ambassador Young says, my next step, I'm going to go down there. So when we went down there and he asked them, because you see, in the Haitian community, when you go down there, you don't go and just tell them what to do. Take them by the hand and says, what is it that you want me to do? Work alongside them rather than telling them, something. I'm imposing you on need, them. You should. Yes. And, and um, basically, they said, we want schools. And they did, they did not even have a home. They said, we want school for our children. We want clinics. So he went down there. We built a school. Um, we went to school. We built a school with, with different organizations, different funders. And we have about now 260, um, 260 kids in the school. And we provided three meals a day. Because going to school in Haiti is a luxury. If you don't have money in Haiti, you can't go to school. Because all the public schools, they're full to an extent that they have a waiting list for at least 10 years. And you have young women. It's a young community in Haiti. Young people. There, there are more young people in Haiti than old people. And um, we started the Pathway to Success program. And um, throughout the school, we were learning that there were some kids that was being trafficked. Trafficked to... They were still going to school. Yes, while they were going to school, because some of them were living with their aunts. And their aunts tell them, you need to bring something to the table. If you cannot bring anything to the table, you need to find something I'm else to do. I, I, Dr. Pierre has been uh, very, very patient here. <laughs> and I would like to ask you, uh, how, how do you work with My Sister's Place? Is it when young ladies uh, in, immediately are uh, admitted, and then you need to check them and make sure that they're healthy or to what extent they've been harmed? You know that in Haiti, the big problem in Haiti is that the health is not at the end of the world. Um, in Haiti, health care, not everybody has access to health care. Just like it's a, a luxury, as you say, the school. Yes, yes. So that means that when a woman is being violated sexually, sexual when a woman is being violated sexually, because of education, because of education, the first step is not to go to the hospital, they stay home. The first step is not to go to the hospital. They stay home and carry the shame. Et le problème avec ça, c'est que du point de vue santé, il va y avoir des impacts au niveau de la santé. Um, to the, uh, to when, to, when it comes to the health standpoint, they go, there's going to be an impact. L'impact du point de vue sexuellement transmissible, des maladies sexuelles. The impact is HIV, um, sexually transmitted diseases. Et aussi un impact sur psychologique. Psychology, um, impact on your, psychology, um, your psyche. Mais si ils avaient eu des informations concernant ces genres de problèmes, ils iraient directement vers l'hôpital pour avoir des, les, une prise en charge adéquate. If they had, if they were educated and if they knew much better, they would go to the hospital where there would be no impact later in the future. Parce que on a on a tout en place pour prendre en charge ces gens de femmes s'ils avaient l'éducation. Dans les 72 heures qui suivent l'agression, elles peuvent être soignées. 72 hours after the aggression, the sexual aggression, we at my sister's place, we have everything set up where the women can get um, tested and they can be psychologists, we can, they can meet with counselors and, and educated. Bien, qu'est-ce que je suis en train de faire avec my sister's place, c'est de voir dans quelle mesure on peut apporter les informations nécessaires. What I do with my sister's place is to bring education, counseling, and also the medical aspect of it, which is the health care. And ensuite, apporter le traitement adéquat envers ces femmes pour éviter les transmissions sexuelles, les agressions en ce genre. And bring to, and, and make sure that they are being tested and make sure that there's no transmitted disease such like as HIV, herpes, and other 
um, sexual uh, transmitted disease. Et en plus, faire un accompagnement psychologique pour ces femmes pour que les séquelles psychologiques ne restent pas longtemps. Ça, c'est vraiment important. And you need to accompany them when it comes to about counseling, about psychology, um, meeting with psychologists. You need to make sure that you meet with, um, they sit down with a psychologist because there's a, there's an impact that lasts longer than anything, anything else. De notre côté aussi accompagner les parents du point de vue légal pour faire des certificats médicaux pour qu'ils puissent apporter leurs problèmes au niveau de, de la justice. And we also make sure we accompany the, the parents of the young person that's being was trafficked or being raped. So they have a certificate, a medical certificate, um, to the same point when they go to justice, um, to the, the legal side of it. They can have access to uh, um, lawyers, they can have access to the judges. And this is what he does as well. Et des fois, je, je peux être comme mes témoins experts au niveau de la justice pour essayer de voir dans quelle mesure je peux être et un témoin pour ces gens-là pour qu'ils puissent avoir la justice qu'il qu faut. And he's also an expert witness mm. because he's a doctor and mm. if they call in to say we need somebody to testify that this person has been raped or been trafficked, there's some trauma, I am an expert to, to be called by the legal system. My Sister's Place, l'organisation que je travaille avec elle, c'est une organisation qui est vraiment intéressée dans ce genre de choses. Qui, me donne, qui nous donne l'appui nécessaire pour aider ces gens au niveau local qui n'ont pas les moyens d'intervenir, soit au niveau médical ou justice. My sister's place is the only one on the ground in Haiti that's doing that type of um, project. And it helps women, it gives women um, um, at least three aspects. Legal, um, it gave us access to the legal um, education and as well as um, access to health care. Maintenant, nous sommes en train de voir aussi dans quelle mesure nous pouvons construire l'hôpital pour qu'elle puisse venir prendre les services et nous référer les gens vers d'autres hôpitaux pour donner les services. Right now, we're, we're um, trying to build a hospital. My sister's place is trying to build a... It's, it's, it's really audacious of us, but <laughs> you got to. Uh, because we're the only one that target women. Because we want to make it a women hospital where women get access to everything, free health care, education, food, and then access to what they can become later on in life. Is it uh, pervasive in society that women do get uh, an OBGYN checkup, or is that, is that still not considered a routine part of one's medical care? For the examens médicaux du point de vue gynécologique, et c'est pas comme aux États-Unis où vous avez l'assurance santé. To for the OBGYN uh, in Haiti, it's not like here where you have access to healthcare. So therefore. Mais il y a certaines organisations sur place qui essaient de faire ça pour prévenir, faire une prise en charge du point de vue gynécologique. There's not enough. It's just there's some non-profit organization that's trying to do that, so women have access to access to a gynecologist, have access for free health care, but it's not open, it's not a thing that's open every day. The clinics are not open every Les day. Les besoins sont énormes. En termes de chiffres, si nous avons 100 accouchements sur le terrain, il y a peut-être 23% qui accouchent à l'hôpital et 73% chez eux. Okay. The needs is tremendous. And um, if um, he was giving you some numbers, um, 23%? 21% go to the hospital. Et 75% accouche chez eux. 75% they're home. They're giving birth Et at home. Because dans they, conditions vraiment difficiles. And they are giving birth to uh, dire circumstances where the, the baby sometimes died in died in route or died at home. Et dans la majorité des cas, ce sont des gens qui sont des fois violés. In majority of the cases, it's women that, that was raped. Qui ne veulent pas aller à l'hôpital pour déclarer l'enfant pour ce genre de choses. They don't want to go to the hospital to declare the child. So they rather have the baby at home. Because in Haiti, if you are raped, you, it's, not, it's not against the law. Your rapist won't go to jail. You only go to jail for more wall for two days. And then they release them. And then when he come back, he gets you again. So in some sense, that adds even more pressure to what you're doing. And that's doing. why exactly. women do not exactly. report cases. 
sexual trauma. They do not report that in Haiti. We're going to explore that a little bit more, but yes. we need to take a break. I want to thank you both yes. uh, very, very much. We're talking to uh, Mia Francine Péan mm -hmm. and uh, Dr. Michelot Pierre about child sex trafficking in Haiti. Uh, like our audience, just stick around and we'll be right back. Thank you. Welcome back to At The Table. We're speaking with the founder and CEO of My Sister's Place, which is a school and so much more in Haiti to help children, primarily young girls who are uh, involved or have survived uh, child sex trafficking. We're here with Mia Francine Péa, as well as Dr. Um, Michelot Pierre, who is an OBGYN affiliated with the school. Thank you so very much. And as I told our audience earlier, we, uh, Dr. Pierre will be speaking in French. Uh, and you will be translating. Thank yes. you so much, Mia. Uh, the, the school, um, as we were mentioning during break, you also have mm -hmm. some vocational training in the leadership training program. Yes. Uh, what is that? We all? have a pathway to success. Once they finish, once they get to 10th grade, we started empowering, empowering those young women, leadership skills, mentoring, where they, we match them up with the private sector. They follow this person for a day or for a week, it, um, it, does, it does matter the extent of the job this person does. So we partner them with Marriott. We have a Marriott in Haiti. We partner them with the Marriott where they train them as a um, reservation agent and also in the kitchen as hostess and also with um, the government. They do a lot of business administration where they either secretary, secretarial work or technology because they're very good in, with technology. And you know, I, I, let me just back up. How many young ladies have gone through your program and what is the age range again? Um, we have um, the last one we rescued, she was eight years old. She was eight years old. We rescued her from Dominican Republic when they were um, expelling all the black Haitian out of who's been born in Dominican Republic, but because of their colors, their skin color, they they tell them that they are not part of Dominican Republic. And she was a modern day slave, slavery, which that she goes to your house, she works from sun up to sundown. And she was nine years, she was eight years old. Now she's about, she's about 11 years old. How did you find her? I mean, how well, did the Jesuit, I work with a, I work with a group called the Jesuit who rescue kids and they would call me. And sometimes they would call you out all kind of hours and you are to and I used to do that with Fulton County where the court will call you and you pick up two case managers and a police officer you go get them and I love doing this they call me mom I have about 60 kids 60 young women who call me mom and unfortunately I lost three of them the last hurricane that hit Haiti Hurricane Matthew um, our home is right across the ocean so I lost three of them, and um, but that's how we get them. We get them from agencies, nonprofit organization that works to rescue young kids, and they would call me at night. I would go get them. Sometimes you have to go at night because the pimp would be looking for you. The person that they're working for would be looking for you. And and you mentioned you lost some children. Your building was severely damaged. Yes, my we lost the building. We lost um, we lost the shelter. We don't have a shelter anymore. The children are displaced. And the school, the roof fell down because we had a lot of trees. And um, actually, um, he saw me. I was crying so much when he went to see me at my hotel um, October 11th yeah. and in Port-au-Prince. My legs was broken. It was in a cast, yes, because I went in the water to get one of them. And when I pulled her up, and she was already dead. Um, the sad thing is when they came to rescue you, because I am an American, I was the only one that was, they said, uh, we we're only picking up American. We're not going to rescue an Haitian national right now. And I told them, just leave me here, I'll die. So <laughs> that's how my leg got broken. Oh my gosh, what a story. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious, Dr. Pierre, and I know we don't have that much time together, and I want to be conscious of that. Uh, how has your life been impacted by seeing the number of, of young girls who have been you know, so abused, as well as you know, the ages? I mean, six years old, eight years old. Et la question, c'est comment, qu'est-ce que tu as dit? Comment vivre impact? As a doctor, yeah. Comment son docteur, comment impact, qui impact ça fait dans la vie? 
En fait, j'ai vu la misère. Actually, I see the misery. Parce que j'ai consulté une petite fille de 3 ans. I, I had a three-year-old girl that I had to... Qui a été victime d'agression de son... She was a sexually abused, a three-year-old girl. C'était un parent. It was her parents. Et lorsque j'ai constaté, j'ai fait l'examen médical pour cette, pour cette fille... When I did the examination for that little, the three-year-old girl... Bon, c'était vraiment terrible. It was terrible. Mais en tant que professionnel, je devais garder mes distances. Because I'm a ça. professional, I have to keep my distance. Mais et au soir, au coucher, when I went home, quand je regarde et la journée et ce qui s'était passé, when I look at my days and what happened, je me suis dit aussi comment comment pourrais-je aider? How do I can how can I help? I was asking myself ce genre that de question. To, to make sure this kind of thing doesn't et, happen anymore. Et je, je ne sais pas si Grâce à My Sister's Place aussi. Thanks qui to My Sister's Place. Je, je rencontré Mia. I met Mia as a friend. On a fait quelque chose d'extraordinaire. And we did something extraordinary. Et on est en train de faire quelque chose d'extraordinaire pour le pays. And we are doing pays. much more for the country. Parce que c'est pas facile. It's not easy. Pour les victimes. For the victim. Pour aller vers les to soins. To go get um, um, les help. Les soins appropriés. The appropriate um, care. Que ce soit du point de vue médical. Um, Medical care. Ou du point de vue justice. Or justice. It's not easy for them. La dernière fois que j'ai été face à un tribunal, c'était pour une petite fille de 5 ans. When I went to, um, to, as an expert witness, the last time, it was for other five-year-old. C'était en 2013. That was 2013. Et maintenant, j'ai été au tribunal en 2016. And then I went back again in 2016 Donc, as an expert dire, witness. Ça veut dire, du point de vue de la justice, les choses vont lentement. From the justice point, it doesn't go swiftly. It just goes slowly. Et maintenant, lorsque la, la fille était venue à l'hôpital à 8 ans d'âge, when the little girl came back, the five-year-old, pour raconter ce qu'elle avait subi, à 5 ans d'âge, at five, c'était vraiment difficile. It was terrible and difficult for her. Et maintenant, on doit faire le lobbying au niveau du parlement aussi. Um, my sister space been lobbying to the parliament level where we've been lobbying so we can pass laws. We I've have. Been, I have been doing that. I'm sorry to say we have less than a minute left, okay. I'm told. My goodness, is there anything that uh, our audience should know? I understand you have some volunteer opportunities. Yes, we need volunteers. Um, we're yes. looking to do partnership with universities where they can go and provide technical assistance and also donation to rebuild the shelter mm -hmm. because right now, the girls doesn't have nowhere to go and they don't have a school. We'll have that website information at the end of the show. Thank you so much very You're quite much, welcome. Mia and Dr. Pierre. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you for having me. And thank you, our audience, for being with us at the table. We'll see you next time.